So we are, we're actually wrapping up a series called Love and Marriage. Originally, it was just going to be two weeks, Love and Marriage. Uh, but last week, when we had to go online only because of the weather, uh, we knew some of you parents would be home watching with your kids. And there are elements of a sermon on marriage that I don't want to inflict on you sitting on the couch with your eight-year-old. So you're welcome. Uh, but today, seventh graders and up, uh, we're all in and we're trusting your parents have talked to you about the birds and the bees and all of that kind of stuff. And if not, you're going to have some questions. So uh, <laughs> good luck. And I think we're all wishing at this point Angie was here, right? Because uh, it's, it's just kind of devolving. Hey, before we jump in, though, I, I do want to tell you. So next week, we're going to start a new series called The Lazarus Life. And I hope you're going to be here. I'm, I'm so so excited for it. We're going to spend basically the rest of the spring, uh, probably through April and, and probably through May as well, exploring the story of Lazarus. So it's, it's found in John chapter 11. If you've never read it before, you can go home and, and read it this week. You'll come in ahead of the curve. Uh, but Lazarus really is kind of a, a microcosm of the gospel story as a whole. It, it asks and answers a lot of the big questions that we ask. Things like, why do bad things happen? Uh, why doesn't Jesus always act when I want him to act? How can my life be used for his purposes and his glory? There's just all of these things and, and so much more. The different way that Jesus looks at our problems versus how we look at our problems. And so we'll, we'll jump into that next week. It's going to be a, a great uh, 12 to 16 weeks for us to explore those things. So I hope you'll be here. It's, it's going to be a great next couple months are a great time for you to uh, invite some friends, family, neighbors, coworkers with you as well. The Lazarus story at its core is a Jesus story. And so every week we're going to talk about how Jesus comes and makes a difference in some of the, the difficult situations that we face. But we'll start that next week. Today, though, we're going to talk about marriage. So if you have a Bible, we will be in Matthew chapter 19 this morning, uh, verses 4 through 9. We're going to look at Jesus' uh, teaching on marriage. So basically what you're getting today is you're going to get the director's cut of uh, one of my favorite wedding messages. So... Um, you know, at, at a wedding, typically, I try to keep that in the 10 to 12 minute range uh, to, to just for the benefit of the bride and the groom, and they all get married outside now, and it's always uncomfortable. So that seems to, to work well for, for everybody. I mean, literally, I'm sweating or I'm freezing at, at weddings from now on, but the pictures look nice and Instagram's great. So, um, and it's not about me, right? It's about you and your pictures and your hashtags. Um, but God bless you. I love it. I do celebrate it. Don't, don't read into my bad attitude. And uh, it's not Valentine's Day at least, so, you know, it could, would have been worse last week. So, uh, uh, but basically at a wedding, it's, it's just this really short, condensed moment. Um, and, and that's both, you know, kind of just out of common courtesy and, and culturally and in our context, that's what's expected. But also, I don't know if you're aware, I don't know how many opportunities you have to preach wedding sermons, but the two worst people in the world to listen to a sermon, worse than a toddler, Worse than a teenager sitting by the person they have a crush on, right? Worse than a mother with a young baby. The two worst people in the world are a bride and a groom on their wedding day. They are completely, I mean, they're totally engaged and completely disengaged at the same time. Uh, and, and so I, I know there's many of you in the room, I've done your weddings, and, and I preach from Matthew 19 a lot at weddings because you can't go wrong with Jesus' advice. So, uh, but today's your chance to actually hear me and, uh, and, and listen to what is being said. And, and in case I had any, any uh, misgivings that, that it actually was effective, uh, last, uh, last year at one point uh, I was doing a wedding and afterwards the father of the groom, he sent me an email. He said, hey, do you mind sending me your outline? I, I loved some of those ideas from Matthew chapter 19. And, and I, was, I was trying to talk to my son about it, uh, the groom, and he said he had no memory of anything you said. Like, did he get the vows? Like, you know, like the important stuff. And, and so we're just going to jump in today. So the setting of Matthew chapter 19 is there are some religious leaders who come to question Jesus. And they're coming to ask him, uh, when is it okay to divorce? All right, so anytime you enter into a conversation about marriage and your primary concern is, how do we get out of this? You know you're probably not coming with good intentions or a pure heart. And so basically these religious leaders are coming and there's different schools of thought and some say you can divorce for this and some say you can divorce for that and some are very, uh, very permissive in when you can divorce and others are very restrictive in when you can divorce. And so they're coming to Jesus basically saying, choose a side. 
tell us, are you on the right side or the wrong side? Are you on the right side or the wrong side? And they're, they're both coming just hoping he'll kind of be the, the, the deciding vote in their long-standing argument. But Jesus doesn't engage in these well-worn arguments. He doesn't get into the nuanced interpretations of the law. Instead, he stops, and as he often does, he pulls us out of the arguments and back to God's original intention. So that's what he's going to do for us today. That's where we're going to spend our time uh, kind of exploring what God's plan for marriage is. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now as we jump into this this morning, we're going to see that unity is God's plan for marriage. Uh, but before we do that, just, just kind of a, a little um, caveat. I understand not everyone here is married. I know we've got single people. I know we have some people who are widowed. I know we have some people who are divorced. Um, I know we have some people who are engaged. I know we have some teenagers that that's not even on your horizon yet. Uh, but what I want to encourage you with this morning is no matter your marriage status, all of us are better when we understand God's intention for marriage and we arrange our life according to it. So if you're single, we're going to talk about some things today that are, are specifically addressed to married people. And there might not be an immediate application in your life. But if you one day hope to be married, or you have friends or family who are married, there's still going to be truth that you can receive, truth that you can apply and put into practice that will set you up for a healthier marriage one day if that's God's plan, or that will help you be part of strengthening the marriages that God has put around you. So the first thing Jesus tells us, instead of arguing about how and when you can divorce, is that God's plan is to unite. He said, the Creator made them male and female, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. As followers of Jesus, we embrace a scriptural view of marriage. Regardless of what culture says, our understanding is that God's intention is for one man and one woman to be united together in a unique, powerful, and exclusive bond that we call marriage. This is what we mean today when we're talking about marriage. It's the bullseye that we're all shooting for. And so what we want to understand then is how does that unity come? That The first way it comes is through our differences, right? One man and one woman. Now, how many of you married someone and then discovered they were different than you? Anybody? How many of you married someone just discovered they were different? Yeah? How many of you are just different? You're like, I don't know if they knew it or not, but they're stuck, right? You got the I do before they knew really who you actually were. Uh, so, so here's what I think is important for us to understand, because sometimes we think, yeah, I, I, I want to be unified in marriage, but my spouse, man, they're, they're so weird, no one can be unified with them. Right? They're so difficult, no one can be unified with them. So, so sometimes when we're married, we'll, we'll go through this process of, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you've been married for a little while and, and uh, somebody says, hey, you, you guys should take a love language test, right? Figure out how you express and receive love. And, and Angie and I did that and it was like, yeah, that's great. We want to know. And then you take it and what do you discover of like, here are the five ways I give love, one through five. Here are the five ways my wife receives love and they are the polar opposite. Right? The number one way she receives love is the number five way I express love. And the number one way I express love is the number five way she receives love. So she is a quality time type of person, loves to be together, loves to, I am really bad at quality time. Like I, I think sitting and not talking and watching a basketball game is quality time. And for 20 years, she's been trying to tell me that it's not, Right? And now I express love through acts of service, and she doesn't care at all about acts of service. So early in marriage, like she, she might have been gone at work, and I would, I would decide, okay, today's the day I'm going to show her how much I love her. I'm going to clean the whole house. 
I'm going to buy her some gifts, right? And she would come home and, and gifts, if, if acts of service is number five, gifts is number four for her, which is good because it's my one and two. Uh, you know, and, and so then she would come home and be like, Angie, notice anything? See how clean the house is? She'd be like, yeah, you live here too. <laughs> I know. Did you see the flowers? I got to take care of those now? Honey, honey, I love you, but she's like, I really just want to sit and talk. Did you see the house? I worked all day so I could sit by myself tonight, right? Well, like, I don't understand why. And here's the thing, like, you have had these moments too of, I love you dearly. Why are you so different than me? And I know that's not the case for every marriage. Sometimes you match up just perfectly and God bless you shut your mouth, no one wants to hear about it, right? Like that, that's really good for you. But I know for many of us, there's this idea of, I want to be united, but man, there's just a lot of stuff to overcome. What I want to encourage you with is that God designed marriage to be a place where differences collide. One man and one woman. One of one kind and one of the other. One that sees the world this way and one that sees the world that way. One that experiences love and affection this way and one that experiences love and affection this way. And he brings us together so our differences can collide and marriage can become one of God's greatest discipleship tools in our life where all of our rough edges are exposed and we're forced to confront them and we're forced to surrender them. And the encouragement from the scriptures is when differences are revealed, that's fine, that's good, that's normal. Now God is going to begin the process of making two people into one. So if you look at your marriage, or maybe you're a single person looking at the potential of marriage, and you're thinking, you know what, I just, I can't find anyone who's enough like me that I want to get married. That's not, the the goal isn't to get married and, and just have someone completely adapt to you. But we're coming into this knowing we are two different people, and yet God's plan is through the presence of his spirit and the resources and tools he gives us to unite two people into one flesh. So differences are normal, differences are common, differences are not a reason to separate, differences are not a reason to divorce, differences are not a reason to give up. The fact that you have different interests or express your love in different ways is not proof that you married the wrong person, that your real soulmate is out there somewhere else. It's just a sign that you're one man and you're one woman and you've been brought together and there's going to be differences. And so when differences collide, we embrace the collision and we ask the Spirit to work and to move in it. Right, so Jesus tells us we're going to be united through our differences. We're going to be united despite our differences. And then he tells us we're going to be united through leaving the old way of life that we've come out of. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So the picture Jesus gives us is of a man literally leaving the home he grew up in, Going, receiving his wife, her leaving the home she grew up in, and they're establishing a new life together. When you say, I do, you are also saying, I don't. I do. I do want to be your husband. I do want to be your wife. And at the same time, you're saying, I don't want to function as a single person anymore. When you get married, you're not just inviting someone in and trying to create an opposite sex version of yourself. But you're saying, I don't want to handle it all. I don't want to determine it all. I don't want to decide it all. I don't want to live as an individual anymore, but I want to surrender to God's plan. I want to be one with you. That first decade or so of your marriage is spent laying down all of the I's and picking up all of the we's. Right? This is how I used to do it, and this is how I used to do it, and discovering this is how we do it. Doesn't mean there aren't benefits from the home you grew up in, but none of us are perfect people from perfect places. And so all of us come into marriage, and there are going to be things from our past that we lay down and lay aside, and there's going to be new things that we pick up and move forward. We're united by leaving that. Now, now your single life, your engaged life, those are all fun, enjoyable seasons. But when you say, I do, you close the door on that season of life. And part of what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 is that husbands and wives are going to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it means as a husband, I no longer have the the right to say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. Everything becomes 
a we decision. Everything becomes a we moment. And, and you know this. I mean, you think of, think of some of the stable, long-term marriages that you know in your life. Whether they're friends or their family, you can't hardly say one person's name without saying the other person's name. The longer and I, Angie, are married, the less it becomes, hey, Chris is doing this or Angie's doing that, and the more it becomes Chris and Angie. Chris and Angie, Chris and Angie, Chris and Angie, Chris and Angie. They're going here, they're doing that, they're thinking this, they're saying that. Why? Because we have left behind the old way and we've committed to forming a new way. This is God's plan for marriage. And Jesus tells us that he will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Now, if if you're a fan of the King James Version, then you would have read that as will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Then I've used united to because, uh, I mean, how many times do you say cleave in the course of your day? Not very many, right? Uh, But that word cleave is is really important for us to understand. United to is important for us to understand because it's not just like a business partnership. It's not just like, hey, we're united, we're holding hands, we're going through life together. But it's, it's revealing something much more specific than that. Dr. Tim Keller says the Hebrew verb, which modern translations render united to, is a Hebrew word that literally means to be glued to something. Elsewhere in the Bible, the word cleave means to unite to someone through a covenant, a binding promise, or an oath. God's plan for marriage is for you to be stuck together with your spouse, right? Not stuck with your spouse. That's different and depressing. Stuck together to your spouse, right? That's empowering and life-giving. And the the picture that Jesus is going to paint for us is one of spiritual and physical unity. Now, the spiritual bond is created when we accept and enter into God's plan for marriage. Spiritual bond is created when we make our vows to our spouse of, I see what God requires, and that's the relationship I'm entering into. I will lay my my life down for you as you will lay your life down for me. The connection God creates is a spiritual connection that is is confirmed and affirmed by the presence of his spirit. this This is the difference between a Christian wedding and a civil wedding. A civil wedding is just a legal contract that's being entered into. A Christian wedding is also a legal contract, but it is also a spiritual covenant. It is saying a man and a woman are entering into the relationship God has designed and they are being joined together by the power of his spirit in that moment and in all of the moments to come. And so for a a Christian husband and a Christian wife, it's not just a I'm going to love you and surrender to you, but it's also a commitment to the Lord of I'm going to love you and surrender to you. And as those three things come together, God, man, and woman, it is supposed to create this strong, unique, powerful, and exclusive bond that is unlike any other relationship we will have in this life. But Jesus doesn't just say that it's kind of this mystical connection that we're going to strive for. He's the creator of heaven and the creator of earth, and he creates a physical connection between husband and wife. When Jesus says that two become one flesh, he is not speaking metaphorically. He's talking about sex. God unites a husband and a wife together through their commitment to his plan to become one. And a massive part of that is unique and powerful connection that comes from sexual intimacy in marriage. Now, there are a a lot of thoughts and a lot of talk about sex in, in our culture. Right, in, uh, of how it works and, and what's best and, and in marriage of what's the best way for that to function. What I want to encourage you with today is, is sometimes Christians, kind of, I think, kind of get a bad rap of, hey, they are, that's like an anti-sex religion. But it's really not. Now, as you read through the scriptures, God is very specific about our sexuality. He is very clear about the boundaries of our sexuality. But within those boundaries, he also makes it clear to us that sex is a gift from God to be embraced for the uniting of a husband and a wife. So God protects sex outside of marriage to preserve the power of sex in marriage. Right, so, so think of it maybe like Velcro. Right, so, so our culture would tell you, you're an individual, 
your future spouse is an individual. And as an individual, you alone control your sexuality. You do what you want, when you want, with whomever you want. And as long as you're not hurting anyone, no one else can say anything to you about it. But what Jesus is telling us is God created a man and a woman to be bound together in a unique and powerful bond. One man, one woman, united in marriage, and two become one flesh. So he's giving us this picture of you were actually created to be bound to the other person. Right? And one of the ways, in fact, the most unique way a husband is bound to his wife and a wife is bound to her husband is through sex. Now, the way our culture does it, though, is it says, no, 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 you can be connected and attached to anything you want to be connected or attached to. And that's not going to affect your relationship with your spouse. But again, God gives us guidelines for sex, not to restrict us or inhibit us, but to protect the power, the connecting power of sex in marriage. So in the same way that Velcro, if you just over and over and over and over again, eventually it's going to lose its stickiness. It's going to lose its connecting power. Your sexuality is the same way. So as a single person, what does that mean? That means that there is, it has to be a recognition in your life of God has a plan for my sexuality and that's for it to be expressed in marriage. So I am not free and it is not good for me to run around and connect to anything and anyone that I want to. Because what I'm doing is I am forming connections and bonds that are intended to be reserved for marriage. And if you are married, it means that sexual intimacy is supposed to be a regular and frequent part of your marriage. How regular and how frequent? That's always the number one question after a service like this. Mostly from husbands. <laughs> Quietly in the foyer. You think I'm joking, but I'm not. I am not at all. I'm, some of you are already like, well, now I can't ask. I'm debating right now of, <laughs> yeah, I will pretend Angie is here. She's a nurse, so she is, uh, she's blunt, very blunt. So studies have shown in most marriages across all ages, right, who are happily married in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I don't know if there are any 90 married year old couples in that survey or not, happily married, and then they follow up with a question, do you have a, a strong physical connection. So God's plan is for two to become one. And one of the ways that he reinforces and strengthens that is through our physical connection to each other. Jesus reinforces that. So if you're uncomfortable, you are not uncomfortable with me. You're uncomfortable with God's plan for your marriage relationship. And God's plan is for sexual intimacy to be part of your relationship. So studies have shown happily married couples who say we have a good physical connection. And then, okay, so how many, right? Across all that spectrum, it comes back of they are happy about one and a half times a week. So there's your number. All right, and some of you can high five and be like, killing it. Um, and some of you are thinking, I got my takeaway, right? Every sermon needs one, and I got one and a half. Um, so, so you're ready to go with it. But, but listen, here's, here's what I want you to know. Right? It's not just to make jokes or make you uncomfortable. It's not just to kind of stick a, a thumb in a sore spot in your marriage because I know there's all kinds of issues that come up. Right? Sex, money, and communication, those are the, the three biggest marriage issues that we see over and over and over again. And so when we embrace God's plan for marriage, we're also embracing God's plan for sex, and his plan is for us to be bound together. Right? And, and if there are issues there, there are people we can connect you with anonymously, privately. Right? We, can, we know how to handle this discreetly to bring life and healing and wholeness into your marriage. But the scriptures are clear. A husband and wife are one flesh. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, The wife's body doesn't belong to herself but to her husband. The husband's body doesn't belong to himself but to his wife. Painting a picture of mutual affection and also mutual compromise. And then he tells us that if you're married, you should not deprive each other of sex except for a very short period of time and only for the purpose of devoting yourselves more fully to prayer. And then you should come back together after a short time so you won't be tempted. 
So if you're thinking, hey, I know that's what God's plan is, but you don't understand we got a different relationship, then you need to hear the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. The only reason for a married couple to not maintain a strong physical connection is if you have mutually agreed for a short period of time to have some intense prayer meetings. And I know some of you love to pray, but nobody loves to pray that much. Right? This is why, because it's not how God designed us. The physical connection between a husband and wife is the single most exclusive aspect of your relationship. You share friendships with other people. You share conversations with other people. You share the things in your heart with other people. You share your financial problems and successes with other people. You share your hopes and dreams, everything else. You have friends, you have family members, you have other people in your life. But this connection, for it to remain as strong and exclusive as God designed, must be protected and must be preserved. So this is what Jesus is telling us. Hey, what's the plan? The plan is to be united. And yeah, you're different, but you're still gonna be united. And part of united is you're gonna leave this old way of life behind. And part of being united is you're gonna enter into this spiritual covenant with the Lord and with each other. And part of being united is you're going to embrace the physical nature of your marriage relationship. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to be embarrassed by. It's something to be celebrated and to be embraced. And so as a single person, it means I'm going to not only preserve myself, but I'm going to help guard other marriages. As a married person, it means I'm not only going to preserve my marriage, but I'm going to guard against being part of anything that would tear another couple apart. So Jesus tells us God's plan is to unite, and then he tells us the enemy's plan is to separate. God's plan is to unite. The enemy's plan is to separate. All right, so, so obviously this makes sense. If God's plan is for two people to become one, the enemy's plan is for two people to be two people. And even if you're married, his plan is for you to live under one roof as two people. The enemy doesn't really even necessarily care if you get divorced all the time. But if he can just get you to live as business partners or roommates, that's not two people becoming one. If he can get you to live as two people who just kind of coexist and work in circles around each other, that's not two people becoming one. So the enemy separates in in a couple ways. First of all, by by just kind of letting marriages drift apart. He lets us separate by convincing single people that, you know what, you're not really made for connection. A marriage thing isn't for you. That's just a made-up thing. That's a cultural thing. That's a church thing. You don't don't need it, right? Jesus refers to, to a gift of celibacy. Right, but refers to it like a spiritual gift. So, so you know it if you got it. And if you don't think you do, you don't. Right? So, so you don't need to worry about that. You're made for connection. You're not made to live in isolation. And if God makes us for connection, the enemy's going to try to keep us in isolation. So over and over and over again in the scriptures, we see God drawing us to himself. We see God drawing us into community. And in marriage, his intention is that we are drawn to our spouse. We're united to our spouse. But the enemy, just because you're united, just because you say, I do, doesn't mean he stops and and says, okay, I lost that one. I'll go attack someone else. But he's going to keep coming after you again and again and again and again. And Jesus lays out for us three marriage separators. The first one he tells us is it's, it's when your heart gets hard. He says, Moses allowed you to divorce because your hearts were hard, but this was not the way it was in the beginning. Right? Sin had such an effect on marriage that there were people who were acting in ways that violated the covenant God had established, that were abusing their spouses. And so Moses had to allow for some way to preserve the t- integrity and safety of people for these marriages that were, that were unhealthy, that were broken, that were no longer covenant relationships to be ended to set people free. Right? Now, now again, Jesus is saying, hey, divorce is only here because your hearts are hard. And so separation in marriage only occurs when our hearts are hard. And so what we want to understand is any time our hearts have grown cold towards our spouse, they have usually first grown cold towards Jesus. And so whenever you're feeling that lack of connection from your spouse, before you say the words no spouse wants to hear, which are we need to talk, Right? Just I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, in, maybe in other marriages that's good, but if I, Angie's ever said that to me or I've said it to her, it's never like, we need to talk about what a great spouse you are. You're just the best, right? It's always, hey, there's some stuff here that, that like, we feel adrift. We need to come back together. We need to, need to fix this. 
But before you tell your spouse, we need to talk, you need to sit down and pray. And you need to talk to the Lord. You need to check your connection with him first. Because as that connection deteriorates, your connection with your spouse will deteriorate. And as your heart grows cold towards the Lord and your heart grows cold towards your spouse, then you begin to believe those separation lies of the enemy. That, yeah, God does have one, but I married the wrong one. The one I had was the one from high school, and I can't believe I ever let him get away. Well, this one's all right, but they're not my soulmate. As soon as the kids are gone, maybe I'll try again with someone else. And if I can figure out the finances, maybe we'll work it this way. You start to believe these lies. Why? Because your heart has not just grown disconnected and cold towards your spouse, but your heart has grown disconnected and cold towards Jesus. A heart that's connected to Jesus is always the best gift you can give to your spouse and always the best gift you can give to your marriage. If you're a single person, the best gift you can give to yourself, to the marriages around you, and to your future marriage is a heart that is connected to Jesus Christ. So so the first thing Jesus says, the enemy tries to separate through hard hearts, then he tries to separate through broken connections. What God has joined together, let no one separate. If you've been married more than a week, you understand the concept of marriage drift. That that you just kind of naturally, over time, you you drift away. And the, the busier you get, and the more stress you experience, and the more kids you have, and the more financial issues that come up, and the more your family needs you, and the more your friends need you, the more you just naturally kind of drift away. And it's, it's not intentional. In fact, it, it normally comes from a pretty secure place where we, we think and we believe no matter what happens in life, she's always going to be there for me, and I'm always going to be there for her. And, and so what we wind up doing is we neglect the most important connection we have after our relationship with Jesus because we think that connection will always be there. But what will happen in your marriage and what Jesus is warning us against is you must give continual, repeated attention to maintaining the spiritual, physical, emotional, relational connection that God intends for a husband and a wife to have. Right? You've, you've got to spend time together. And so when you notice drift, don't assume it's going to get better on its own. I don't know if you've, if you've ever been on a boat in a lake, and, and there's that moment you're driving around, right? Maybe you're pulling people on a tube or skiing or, or you're out fishing, and, and when you shut the boat off, as soon as the engine turns off, you start to drift, right? If, if it's a windy day, you're going to drift in the direction of the waves. If you're in an Oklahoma lake that's fed by a river and goes out to another river, you're going to drift with the current. And the same thing happens in marriage. When you stop intentionally moving towards each other, you start drifting apart from one another. So Jesus is telling us, hey, this is going to happen, so just pay attention and stop it. When you see it, pay attention. The same way you got to turn the engine back on and head in the direction you want, so when you notice it in your relationship, you got to stop what you're doing and be intentional to be drawn back together. Right? And then, then the, the last thing Jesus tells us will separate a husband and wife is sexual immorality. In fact, this is the the only allowance that Jesus gives us for divorce. And it's really important for us to to understand and to pay attention to because what he's telling us is, is there are instances where someone steps out of the covenant of marriage and engages in sexual activity with other people, and in doing so, they break the covenant. And he does not require divorce in those circumstances, but he does allow for it. Because he understands there are times where the break in the covenant is so severe between a man and a woman that it cannot be recovered or restored. It doesn't mean God can't, won't, or doesn't want to redeem and renew that relationship. It means Jesus isn't requiring you to stay in it if that has occurred to you. And and so if he's that serious about it, then we need to be that serious about it as well. It means that that we have to pay attention and understand that that your sexuality as a married person is not your sexuality. It is a we area of your life. As a single person, what does that mean? It means you do not want to establish patterns of thought and action as a single person that are going to be detrimental to your physical connection to your spouse. So you're going to live in accordance with it. And and so if if these are the ways the enemy separates, then then let's just think real quickly as we finish about what our marriage commitment is. So single or married, what is our commitment? First of all, we're going to honor God's plan. 
We're going to recognize we were made to participate in God's plan for marriage. We were made to be connected to our spouse. Whether we are single or engaged or married, we can walk that path today. Right, from our seventh graders to our 95-year-olds, everyone can make this commitment of I will honor God's plan for marriage. Secondly, whether you're single or married, you can determine and commit, I will maintain a soft heart towards the Lord. And if you're married, I will maintain a soft heart towards my spouse. I will assume the best. I will seek opportunities to be brought together. I will give them the benefit of every doubt. I will stop trying to read their mind and stop expecting them to read mine. And instead, my heart will remain soft towards them and soft towards the Lord, and he will unite us together. The third thing that we can all do is we can remain united. If you're married, it means you're going to remain united to your spouse. You're going to recognize that God intends for two to become one in your marriage. He wants to form a unique, powerful, and exclusive bond between you and your spouse. And so you're going to guard it. You're going to protect it. You're not going to let anyone separate what God has joined together. If you're a single person, it means you're going to see that's the goal you're striving for. And you're also going to commit to living in a way now where you are helping others have that experience. And the last thing we're going to do, whether we're single or married, we're going to reject sexual immorality in our lives. We're going to refuse to believe the lie that what I do in private only affects me and no one else. Right, if they're at Christian Chapel, we have a a men's group called a Conquer Group that is all about helping men walk a path of victory when it comes to lust and temptation. Right, and and so that's a that's a group you can join. We'd love to get you connected with it. Dads, that might be a victory that you have achieved in your life. That's awesome. But if you've got sons, you should go check out that Conquer Group to give yourself more resources to help them. Ladies, I I know sexual immorality. It's it's not a male problem. Right, It, it affects all of us. The enemy that tempts us all. And so we have pastors, we have people standing ready to walk with you. But to reject sexual immorality is also to embrace God's plan for sexuality. So if we're married, we're going to make a commitment. We're going to become one. We're going to stay one. And if we're single, we're going to say, hey, I'm going to preserve sex for marriage to protect the power of it in my marriage. And if I've stepped outside those bounds, I'm going to seek forgiveness. I'm going to seek healing. I'm going to seek restoration. I'm going to confess my sins and believe that Jesus is faithful to forgive, to renew, and to restore. If you'll stand with me, I want to pray for you. Then the band's going to come back. They'll lead us in a final song this morning. Jesus, we come to you today. And we thank you that when it comes to, to one of the most important relationships in our life, or the marriage relationship, that you haven't left us to figure it out on our own. We thank you that the scriptures give us clear guidelines, a clear path to follow. And so, Lord, I pray for every single person that's in the room this morning, Lord, as they are maybe waiting for your plans for marriage to be revealed in their life. I pray that you would help them to remain committed to you. Help them not only to trust your plan, but to trust your timing to believe that at the right time you will bring them into the right relationship where they will be made one as you intend. Lord, I pray for every married person here this morning, whether their spouse is with them or not. Lord, I pray that you would pour your spirit out on these marriages today. Will you soften the hearts of husbands and soften the hearts of wives towards you? Will you soften their hearts towards each other? Lord, will you show us that your plan is to unite us together, spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally. Lord, I pray for a renewed commitment among husbands and wives to pursue your path of unity. And Jesus, we pray against everything and anything and anyone that would seek to separate us from the spouse you have given to us. Lord, help us to recognize temptation while it is still far off and to flee in the opposite direction. Help us, Lord, to confess our sins, to receive your forgiveness, to walk in transparency, accountability, and honesty with our spouse. Lord, I pray that you would come even today and you would begin to renew, to strengthen, and restore the relationships between husbands and wives. Lord, I pray for those spouses who they're following Jesus, but their spouse is not today. Will you bring extra encouragement to them that as they are faithful to you, you are calling and drawing their spouse to you through them. Jesus, we thank you that marriage is a good idea because it's God's idea. So we ask that you would help us to receive it and to walk in it. In Jesus' name.